thank you everyone for joining us this evening for um, the Early Career Network AGM and CPD and Chartership Information Evening. Um, I'm joined by Sean Richardson and Becky Goddard from the JOLSOC. Following the AGM, Becky will be introducing the, the JOLSOC CPD program for the year and then Sean will be giving us a presentation on Chartership and the online application form. So a small introduction to the, the Early Career Network. The, the key aim is um, to provide support and guidance for professional development across all sectors of geoscience. The Early Career Network was formed in 2019 and um, it's principally aimed at people who started their careers or finished their first degree um, within the last 10 years, although we're fully inclusive and the network's open to anyone who's interested in its activities. The committee was um, appointed at the last AGM in February 2020 um, we're a team of 10 with um, four officers, the chair, the treasurer and the secretary. And then Dan Hope is our external group liaison. So if you're from a regional group or a group outside of the dual SOC, Dan is a person to talk to. Um, we're active on Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter with the handle ECN dual SOC. We post on there about all of our, all of our events and our activities. So that's the best place to follow us. The content that we post varies across all three. So if you use any of them, it's a good idea to follow us on all three. We also have our own page on, um, on the JOLSOC website, so you can look up our activities on there and our email address is included if you ever want to reach out to us. Unfortunately, Josh Hughes is um, retiring from the committee this year. Um, Josh was in, one of the founding members and has been active for two years. On behalf of the committee and the whole of the ECN, I'd like to say a big thank you to Josh. I'm sure my fellow committee members would um, agree that without his help and his input, the Early Career Network wouldn't have got to where it's got to today. However, it means that we do have an opening. So if you're interested in joining the ECN committee, um, please send us a couple of paragraphs introducing yourself and your background and why you'd like to join. And if you could apply via email to our email address, which is there. And the deadline is about two weeks time, so 16th of May. We'll be putting this out on our on our social media in the coming days. So anybody who's here today has got a bit of a head start. But thank you, Josh, for all of your hard work. So as I say, the, the network's principally aimed at those who completed their first degree less than 10 years ago. But we are open to anybody who's interested in our activities. And if you don't fit within that category, please don't feel excluded. Um, if you're interested in an event that we're hosting, please do sign up and get involved. Um, our key objectives are to promote and support professional development across all sectors of geoscience, provide opportunities for mutual support and networking, engage with external groups, both within the dual SOC, so the regional groups and the, the special interest groups, but also groups outside of the dual SOC, and also to promote diversity, equality and inclusion. Prior to our AGM last year, we, we did a, a survey of our members asking what events and activities um, they would like us to, to provide. Uh, the, the main standouts were careers and chartership, events in, including talks and, um, and field trips and conferences and also networking opportunities. Given the, the COVID restrictions that we've faced over the last year, the, the ECN has moved entirely virtually. Um, so unfortunately, we haven't been able to provide any any face-to-face -face networking events. However, because we move virtually, um, our sphere of influence has expanded greatly. And the, the events that we've hosted this year have been oversubscribed much more than we've ever had before. And we've also been able to attract members from overseas and away from our typical London base when we do face-to-face -face events at Burlington House. Over the course of this year, we've had three, or we provided three flagship events. The first event was um, a panel event, which Josh kindly hosted for us on the effects of COVID-19 on the geosciences and related industries. We were um, joined by five expert panelists, including the president of the Judgical Society and the director of the BGS and three senior people within industry. Uh, that was attended by about 150 people or so. We were also able to provide a Diamond Foundation course, um, which was presented by the Beers. So they, um, they awarded the ECN 100 free places uh, it's like an online workshop, which normally costs $250 a place. 
Uh, the ECM, because we're, we're funded by the JawSoc for any event which is oversubscribed or offers a great subsidy, the priority is always given to fellows or candidate fellows and then people who fit within our, our target demographic. And our final flagship event was um, in collaboration with the Society of Economic Geologists. And we offered a, a four hour morning workshop on IOGAS. This is our most attended event to date. Uh, we had over 300 attendees live. And um, that was posted on, on the YouTube channel for the JawSoc and has been viewed by many more people since. Um, here we can see our, our membership growth over the last year. So we were formed in 2019 with zero people. Um, we, we had up to about 300 people on our on our Facebook and Twitter pages by the end of by the AGM last year, and that has grown exponentially. And we have now have over a thousand people on our mailing list. Um, a slight comment on finances: due to COVID restrictions, we've had very little expenditure. All of our panelists and hosts of the workshops kindly did it for free, um, and we haven't charged for any of our events this year, so. We have very little expenditure, very little income, uh, but we are awarded an annual budget by the GSL, who have very kindly renewed it for next year. It's worth pointing out that all of the committee members don't take any, any salary. This is all, all voluntary work and all of the budget is spent on the ECN, our events and our members. If anybody would like the written financial summary for this year, that's available on request from our treasurer. Um, if you just drop us an email, we can we can provide that to anybody who would like to have a look at it. Some future events that I'd like to um, announce today. So the, the Early Career Network's now taken over the Early Career Award that unfortunately was been, um, been closed down by the Geological Society due to lack of resources. So we, we, we've taken over that and we're going to be running it going forward. Um, we have our first final. So that will be on Thursday, the 27th of May. So please, if you'd like to like to come watch, you're more than welcome. Uh, the regional champions will be giving a 10 minute presentation each and every finalist will be awarded a free GSL membership and the ECN will be providing a hundred pound voucher for the winner and a geology themed trophy. Following this event, the, um, the next cycle will be announced and that will be our, the, the ECN first full cycle of the early career award. So if you're interested, please, um, Please join. A bit pictures of um, the ECN zone, Hugh Richards, and he was a 20, 2017 winner of the, the Early Career Award with his geology themed trophy. I'm also very happy to announce the ECN guest lecture series that will be starting for the second half of the year. So we'll be having one event every, every month with a guest speaker. We've already picked the, the topics, so communications and the geosciences, building materials, alternative industries, energy transition, mineral exploration and mining. So we, we hope that there's going to be something in there for everyone. These talks will be, be focused towards early careers. So there'll be how to get in the industry, the, the career options within the different industries. Um, so yeah, we hope, we hope you'll be able to join us for, um, for our guest lecture series. The first one will be in, in June and we have a festive special planned for December. So that brings the end of our, our AGN. So thank you very much for your support. The, the Early Career Network is, is run by Early Career Fellows for Early Career Fellows. So without you, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have anything, anyone to, to provide events for. Please follow us on our, our social media. And if you have any thoughts or you'd like to get involved in the ECN and its activities, please, please do drop us an email. We're, we're always looking for, for helping hands. And if you're interested in joining the committee, please, please do apply. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pass on to Becky. Um, I'd also like to point out that we, we do have the, the Q&A box um, at the top or the bottom of your screen. So if you've got any questions on either what I say, Becky says, or Sean, please do pop them in and then Sean will be doing a question answer session on the chartership at the end of this, end of his presentation. Hi everyone. Um, I'm just about to share my screen one moment. You should be able to see it. Um, so my name is Becky Goddard. I work um, on the events team at Gelsoc. Um, I'm working um, with the online training committee um, to produce um, different training programs um, that we can use um, towards chartership. 
So the current program is Geohazards courses. Um, it's kind of halfway through at the moment. We began in January and it runs to July. Um, it's a wide reaching program that's really useful um, for many people who work in sectors in geosciences and civil engineering. Um, each session is 60 to 90 minutes long, um, so it includes a lecture with um, either one speaker or two speakers, um, and there's a Q&A session at the end. Um, we hold these virtually over Zoom, um, and then the delegates um, can um, access a temporary recording that's live for two weeks, um, so they can go back, make further notes and watch bits that they're not sure of. Um, we send out um, certification for each session, um, so that counts towards chartership applications, um, and we also suggest further reading and other resources um, for each session subject. Um, so far, the series has been really successful. Um, we've had approximately 350 people register um, and really nice feedback um, from attendees. So um, we kind of welcome you know, um, any ideas and um, suggestions that people have. Um, there's also been the option to purchase um, the special publication from our publishing house at a discounted rate that links to this series. Um, so kind of going forward um, with new courses kind of this coming autumn and beyond, um, we're launching another kind of set of online courses. Um, these will be on instrumentation, earthworks, remote sensing and mining. Um, we haven't currently got any details yet um, on our website, but we'll be announcing them kind of in due course. Um, they'll be in a completely different format um, to the courses that we're already running. So they will be half day, full day sessions. Um, and a little more interactive as well. Um, so it won't just necessarily be a lecture. Um, there'll be kind of more interaction and tasks involved. Um, so going forward, um, we welcome any ideas for courses, speaker suggestions or general feedback to help us grow this area and support you further in your careers. Um, my email address is um, on the screen, so if you would like to get in contact with me, um, please do, um, and yeah, we can kind of try and work together to um, create something new. So thanks ever so much, anyone, and if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Thanks a lot for that, Becky. Okay. Sean, can we, can we pass over to you, please? Okay, good, good evening, everybody. My name is Sean Richardson. I'm the Chartership Officer for the Geological Society. Um, I deal with chartership issues. I also organize all the interviews, processes, and uh, communication regarding chartership. Um, if you have any questions on any aspect of chartership, you're very welcome to contact me, and I provide an email address at the end of this. Today's... Um, <clears throat> This is the outline of my talk. I'm going to give a brief introduction about chartership. And then uh, the new area that we're going to focus on is the online application process. This is a new initiative by the Geological Society. We've been trying to uh, achieve this for quite some time now, but I'm pleased to say that this is now already in place. Um, we're currently doing a, 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 a standard um, interviews around uh, for May, June, but from September onwards, any new applicants will be applying through the online application. And I wish to uh, take you through it and show you how it works. It's quite uh, seamless and quite painless. Um, and then uh, to help you all, um, I'm going to go through some of the common pitfalls uh, that I've noticed over the last few years from uh, candidates and uh, give you some um, general advice and guidance about how to avoid them. 
and then just a bit of final additional information at the end just to uh, close down this uh, talk. So I'll start with the introduction. Um, I'm often asked why, why should you become chartered? Um, really my answer is uh, threefold um, and I've shown you the three key things which I deem uh, important for um, deciding to uh, apply for chartership. The first is the opportunity. Um, this is really the only uh, professional geological qualification in the UK. Uh, the Geological Society is the only uh, organisation who can award uh, geological uh, uh, geological uh, chartership, and that's all down to the um, um, the, the uh, down to jo uh, King George IV back in the eighteen hundreds who um, gave it his seal of approval. Secondly, it's becoming more important. This is a client driven initiative, um, you know, because chartered geology, um, in the case, a professional practitioner who has been peer assessed and demonstrates key professional competencies in their field of practice. And then finally, um, I think uh, more and more in, um, going forward in the future, chartered geology uh, is actually a qualification that's becoming a legal and regulatory requirement. Uh, it's very difficult to sign off reports and provide professional consultation without uh, being chartered. So I'd like you all to bear this in mind and hopefully those who aren't already chartered will consider this something that they really feel they need to do to progress their careers going forward. So in terms of the application process, um, the first thing to do is to decide which chartership to apply for. Um, you know, you've got a choice between chartered geologist or chartered scientist, and the, the Geological Society um, uh, basically run both of those uh, charterships, and very similar. The bulk of this talk is going to be based on chartered geologist. However, uh, you'll find there's very few differences um, in terms of the process itself. So then the, next, the first step after deciding the chartership um, is to submit an online application. We then assign two scrutineers to review those applications and determine if uh, an interview is warranted. That may actually take, you know, may be a little bit iterative. Um, they may request some additional information. Uh, so there's a bit of a circle to close there. And then you'll be invited to interview. At the moment, we've been uh, running video conferencing interviews. That's been in place now since the first lockdown back in April, uh, sorry, March last year. Um, and we foresee that continuing right throughout 2021. Um, following the interview, uh, myself as charge chief officer is uh, provided with a result from the two scrutineers. I then recommend to the charge chief committee and then to the uh, council um, committee um, which are the body that uh, actually formally elect charters, chartered um, members. And then following that um, decision by council, I can then advise you with the result. So this whole process, you could expect it to take about three months in general. However, um, from a candidate perspective, you're probably talking, uh, you know, once you've actually submitted your application, it's probably a very short period of time that you need to work on this. Uh, it's really uh, putting together a presentation and just reviewing your uh, application prior to an interview. So now I'd like to talk you through the application process, uh, the online application. Uh, for many years, it's all been paper-based um, application where you uh, email in uh, the different components assembled in the geological site and then move forward. This is a big step forward. Um, the online application it means that everything can come in directly into um, you know into the server in JOSO and then uh, we can send it straight out to scrutineers as well so hopefully streamline the whole process to log on the first thing you do uh, go to this url um, which is shown here in yellow and you'll basically land on the homing page for the chartership application and then there's a step-by-step -step process that you take through from applicant details right through to your final declaration. And uh, in brackets underneath, I've just shown you the, uh, the, the terminology that we use for the individual components of the application, AD1, 2, 3, 4, and then SD1 to 6. 
and uh, I'll, I'll briefly touch on all these going forward. So as I mentioned earlier, you firstly you need to decide, are you applying for chartered geologist or chartered scientist, uh, which you see here. Um, essentially, my recommendation is if you have a background in geology, you have a degree or, or uh, some sort of geoscience um, um, uh, qualification and you work with geoscience data, uh, I would recommend you go for chartered geologists first, and then um, if you work with science data, um, go for chartered scientists. And you can actually take both charter ships. <clears throat> but um, I strongly advise against trying to do them both at the same time because it's quite difficult. Um, once you've decided which uh, charter ship to uh, aim for, then you uh, it's quite simple here. The second box, um, for less than 20 years, it's a standard conventional application. Um, but if, it's, if you've got more than 20 years experience, uh, the, uh, there's a streamlined option available where you submit less data, um, you know, based on your longer experience and career. <clears throat> and basically this is uh, the next few slides, I'm just going to take you through the um, essentially AD1, you know, the first form. Um, hopefully people have already seen the forms and they've looked on the website to see what, what is required. Um, we've basically just streamlined everything and put it into an online system. So you go through all the applicant data here and then your area of competency. We now have drop down lists instead of having to type in uh, what your competency is. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with this, uh, the competency that you apply for is what you will be um, charted in at the end of the day. <clears throat> so you will be charted in, for instance, as a chartered geologist, and on this box here, you would be um, uh, competent in, com uh, in contaminated land and maybe one other uh, secondary area. Um, you know, so you're not con just bear in mind if you have a chartered geologist uh, title, you're not competent in all areas of geology. And just for example, my own competency is oil and gas uh, as a petroleum geologist. So that is my competency area. I don't step out of that. Um, you know, when I'm talking to people. And then uh, the next step is to fill in your qualifications, um, academic qualifications, and you can add more qualifications just by hitting the green button. Um, and then you go on to professional bodies and memberships. Um, and again, you can add as many as you want to in that. And then uh, talking about your different employment, um, you know, again, it's very similar. You're just adding all your different um, employment roles, um, description of your duties, and then just keep adding a role uh, for, you know, stacking them all up. Do these in chronological order um, as well. Finally, add our sponsors. Um, bear in mind that these the regulations actually um, ask you to provide two professionally qualified people uh, normally would expect them to be chartered geologists or chartered scientists uh, from the Geological Society. However, um, I myself as chartership ship officer do have some flexibility and, um, you know, if you can only find one chartered person, uh, please speak to me directly before you submit and uh, discuss other options. Uh, for instance, you know, people who are chartered in other countries uh, from different organisations or people uh, who are members of professional bodies. And then uh, there's another page here, you know, really we're trying to uh, encourage people who apply for chartership to also offer their services in terms of volunteering as a mentor or CPD reviewer or a chartership scrutineer, depending on your level of experience. This is very important. Um, you need to keep saving manually as you go from one screen to the other, uh, one section, and you'll be sent a link in case you need to uh, go back to that uh, and edit it later. So uh, all the previous slides were all about the AD1, which is you know normally the sort of introduction to um, the application. Um, moving on then to uh, the other section, which is a professional report. Um, and again, you can download a template for AD2 uh, here, and then you just uh, manually complete that offline, and then you upload it uh, 
at this point here. So uh, basically that allows you then to put as much as you want into there. Um, obviously uh, keep it sensible in terms of the, the number of words or pages you, uh, you add. And then moving on to the uh, AD3, which is a competency overview. Um, anyone applying under the 20 years plus experience uh, route is, is not required to fill in this form. Um, again, it's another one, it's an online form. So these boxes open out as free text boxes. And uh, you've got um, basically some guidance on each one for the seven competency criteria. Um, uh, uh, so it explains what is required and you can fill that in. Uh, suggests that um, you know you put in several paragraphs. It says here no more than two, but you know if you really feel you need to put more in, do so. The the, the basically the um, you know the point of filling this in is to actually convince and uh, demonstrate to your scrutineers that you meet the various uh, competency criteria. So you will need to give some evidence here, and hence you know you may need to add a bit more extra detail. Um, this one, this form here, I'm showing now is really specific to um, the CGL, uh, Chartered Geologist. Uh, if you were doing the Chartered Scientist route, there would only be five boxes. Uh, there's only five um, competency criteria. I'll show you them right at the end, but uh, just bear that in mind. So be different um, level of understanding you need, different, um, different wording. So, uh, you know, but essentially they're the same. And again, don't forget to save this as you when you complete it. <clears throat> AD4 is CPD. Um, this is a key part of the application process, uh, continuing professional development. Um, we believe that all professionals should actually be doing CPD, even if they're not chartered. However, it is mandatory once you are chartered to uh, complete CPD every year. Um, you can look on the website for further information, but essentially, um, CPD is supposed to be developmental. Um, it covers a range of different types of activities um, in different categories. And if you're in full-time employment, you are expected to uh, complete at least 90 hours of CPD per year. If you're working part-time, then it's 50 hours at least. Um, the key thing about this is um, people should be aware that it's, it's under the, um, basically the plan action reflect system um, it was changed back in 2017 to this, so um, essentially bear that in mind. So you basically plan your CPD for the year, then uh, you fill it in and you know complete your records during the calendar year under the activities with some evidence. And then uh, at the end of the year, you also reflect on what you've done, what you've achieved and what you've learned. Um, and there's several ways to do this. You can either do it via the CPD uh, schemes that on the website. So there's, a, there's an Excel spreadsheet uh, template which you can download and add in and then upload it here on this, uh, on this page. Or you can use the online tool, um, which you know you fill it in and then basically uh, save it as a PDF and then um, upload it again. Or you can use your own company um, schemes uh, if you have them. And also bear in mind that um, um, <clears throat> It's, it's probably quite a good good thing to do is to actually try to um, link this in some way and align it with your own company um, targets and um, basically your own objectives that you set in your companies. Um, so that way, then you, A, you're more likely to complete it uh, and B, you know, you, it's benefiting you through your company as well as, uh, you know, basically meeting the requirements for the geological society. And again, not to be forgotten, you must save after you've completed this. This is something extra I've just stuck in. Um, I would recommend anybody who's not seen this, go to the uh, Geological Society website and download your own copy. Uh, we call this the mind map. Um, it basically shows a large number of uh, CPD activities uh, which you can, um, you can record uh, during the year for completing CPD. The six main categories here, um, and what I would say is that uh, on the job is one of the categories that is probably the most important. You need to uh, have at least 30% of your total CPD um, from on the job um, category. 
um, and then the rest can be spread over the, re the remaining 70%. And, um, you know, I find this, uh, think of this as your sort of Bible for CPD, uh, print out an A A3 uh, copy if you can do, and keep it handy when you complete your CPD, um, you know, because it will actually prompt you to, um, you know, whatever you've done, you know, you know how to categorise it and uh, add it in. Anything that doesn't quite fit here, you just, you know, you can assume there's another other section down here and, you know, you can add that in as well. The bottom line is make sure it's developmental. You know, the whole point of this is, you know, it should be something that you're learning from um, and it's not something you do on your day-to-day -day work. And then um, moving on now, we've called the AD1 to AD4, AD, uh, SD1 to 6 are your supporting documents. This is probably the bulk of your application for those who need to do this. Um, you can see up here, anyone with 20 years of experience or greater is not required to uh, submit this. So essentially think of this as, uh, these are basically project examples that you've, that you've done um, during your career that you're using to support your competency for the seven criteria. Um, you must show evidence in here um, and you must make it clear that it's your own work and not basically team effort. I won't read out all this, but there's a whole series of different things you can include in this. Um, but they also must be verified as well. So you've got the verifier's name and organisation. This verifier is someone who's who's aware of uh, what you've done on this uh, report, uh, this supporting document, and um, you know will testify to that. And again, these are offline records, reports, or pieces of work that you then upload. Um, onto this online system. And uh, you just use this box down here to keep adding further documents, okay? And at the end of the day, then you, um, once you've fill, filled all those forms in, then we want you to uh, sign your declaration and uh, make payment. This is a free a text box where you can actually sign this record with your mouse, your, your cursor uh, and date it. And then you can finally make payment. Uh, a new addition now is that you can easily pay by debit or credit card, uh, as well as PayPal. So, you know, it's all set up, so you can do it directly from here. And then uh, your sponsor statements, you know, they, they've, your two sponsors will actually submit their forms separately. Um, so they are confidential to the candidate, um, you know, so, uh, what we ask you to do as a candidate would be to choose your sponsors wisely and then show them your entire report, your application before they uh, submit their or complete their statement. And then, you know, politely cheer them along and make sure that they, um, they submit it in, uh, in a reasonable time frame. So uh, hopefully, you know, that's fairly straightforward and it, it should be much more uh, less painful than some of the, uh, the other formats that we had. You know, we used to get people downloading old versions of the forms or sitting on them for several years and submitting them and they're completely out of date. This way now there'll be no excuse. You know, you basically have to go online and, and tear the form directly from the website and it will be the latest version and, you know, should be straightforward to fill in. And you can keep a copy of it afterwards by saving it and receiving the link of your application. So now I'd like to move on to the common pitfalls. Um, over the last few years when I've been doing this role, I've uh, sat in on quite a lot of the uh, uh, interviews and also seen, more, seen all of the uh, applications. And there's been some common mistakes made time and time again, uh, which I've had to go back to the candidate and uh, point them out and ask them to re resubmit. Hopefully, um, I'll, I'll show you the key ones um, for the different forms, and hopefully, then you'll make sure that at least you, you avoid making the same mistakes. So, on AD1, um, basically, you must remember to only nominate one or two areas of expertise on the form. These are the areas of special uh, competency that you're applying for. Um, the, the danger is if you keep uh, adding more than two. Um, and I'm not even convinced you can add more than two now with the online form, but um, the problem would be that uh, you would have to pass all seven criteria for each of those specialities. 
And the problem is, you know, if you fail on one, you would have failed in, you know, for the whole um, interview. Make sure you've also collected signatures, verifiers, and also request your sponsors to submit their statements. Uh, if we don't get the sponsor statements in time, then we uh, were unable to interview you, I'm afraid. On AD2, um, this is basically the professional report. Uh, make sure your, your form is verified by your relevant supervisors and managers who were um, in charge at the time you did the work or you did the uh, you worked in that particular role in that company. Um, Cross-reference relevant parts of your professional report to the selected competency criteria detailed on the form AD3, uh, which and also within the SDs one to six. <coughs> so make it as easy as possible for your scrutinies to find the evidence of competency within the, the form. Sometimes, you know, it's hidden in there, but it's not explicit. And, um, you know, scrutineers have to search hard to find evidence. You know, the, the easier you make it for them, you know, the, um, the better it is all around. And then um, finally, make sure you focus on what you have done yourself and um, demonstrate your competency as a geologist on this. On AD3, this is the competency uh, report, essentially going through um, criteria one through to seven for chartered geologist and uh, competency one to five for chartered scientist. Again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this again, but it is quite important. You really have to focus on what you have done yourself and you demonstrate your competency as a geologist or alternatively as a scientist. Um, make sure you provide strong evidence in support of your claim of competencies. You know, it's not sufficient just to say on the form, um, you know, I meet the criteria or I meet the competency. Um, you've got to show some evidence and you can point to the evidence in your supporting documents or on your alternative forms. You should also cross-reference parts of this AD3 form to AD2 and again within SD16. Um, again, the more times you sort of cross-reference things, the more you're going to emphasize uh, you know, the evidence and your scrutineers will find it very easy then to um, agree that. Bear in mind, you know, they'll probably have some sort of a tick sheet template um, or spreadsheet and as they read through your application they'll be ticking off the evidence you know uh, that they found for the different competency criteria so I'll make it as easy as possible AD4 uh, in terms of the CPD um, again make sure you follow, follow the um, plan action reflect format and meet the minimum required hours very important, do not include a large number of hours which you cannot support. Um, it's better to gradually add to the CPD record. You, you know, use the mind map for examples. Um, you, if you use the online tool, it's ideal. You can just keep adding on bits and pieces, you know, one, two hours a time on that. And it will gradually add up and it will show you the total you've done. And then make sure the activities de developmental, you know, and, you know, ideally you should try and link this to company training objectives. Uh, we do ask for evidence um, on CPD. There's not a lot of room on most of these spreadsheets. So we're just asking for some very simple evidence of activity. You know, you could name the, uh, the journal or the title, the paper you've written, uh, read, for instance, or, you know, the, the date of the meeting you went to or something like that, you know, nothing too too fancy or too difficult. AD5, um, this is really all about the uh, sponsor statements. You know, it's not really, I wouldn't really turn into pitfall because it's out of your hands, but you know, you do have the responsibility to show the sponsors your entire application. They're then expected to provide you with some critical feedback um, before your submission. Um, you know, they should be pointing out issues around competency, make sure it all ties together. Um, but, and then, you know, we have to make sure that the sponsor statements are signed and include their, their own charge details. I realize that candidates are in a difficult position, you know, but you know, you could um, possibly remind them of this, but you won't see the sponsor statement. So it's difficult to sort of, um, you know, close a circle on this, but also request them to send their statements as early as possible. Um, if they are late, then, you know, there's a high likelihood you'll be postponed. 
because the scrutineers want to see everything. So that's all the, the main bulk of the forms. I'm, I'd like to move on to the supporting documents now. Um, and I said, this is a bulk of the application for most applications. We would like you to include up to six carefully selected projects. Um, don't include more than six uh, because the scrutineers just won't read the seventh. You know, they won't go through all seven and then decide which are the best six. They don't have time to do that. Um, we prefer you not to um, um, submit confidential company reports for two reasons. One, you know, some of the text often is redacted and difficult to pull together. Um, they're often also um, team efforts and also basically they're often template driven by the companies. So, you know, they're not as useful as you might think they are. Um, you need to focus on demonstrating your own work and the application of geological knowledge. And important, I put it in practice, but a lot of scrutineers are looking to understand your thought process through a project. You know, why did you do a certain thing? Uh, and why, you know, why did you choose different parameters on different, different um, tools, etc. Sorry, just go on. Um, some of the examples of supporting documents, if you don't want to submit a, a report, uh, things like interpreted cross sections, ground models, maps and diagrams. Um, these can all be used to explain the geology or science underlying a project. They show your evidence of um, competency as a geologist. Um, they, they cover criteria one and two quite nicely. Um, you can also use them to explain uh, why you've done certain things or you know, where the uncertainties lie. Uh, the other thing is you should make sure that uh, details are legible to scrutineers. Um, this is something that came out when you do face-to-face -face interviews. Uh, you know, people, some candidates uh, basically condense maps and sections onto an A4 sheet of paper within a Word document. So uh, the PDFs are, tend to be pixelated or not very clear um and sometimes illegible um so in those cases we ask candidates if they're going to a face-to-face -face interview print out some large-scale versions of the maps and sections that you can spread on the table in front of the scrutineers and they can read the you know the, the details and ask you questions about them if we're still doing um virtual interviews i would recommend that you keep some of these maps and sections as separate documents and then share them on screen with your scrutineers if they ask for that. And not to be forgotten, it's not just about competency criteria one and two for um, uh, chartered geologists, it's about all seven competencies. And likewise for a chartered scientist, it's about all five competencies. So some of the issues I've noticed, um, you know, you should really try to work with what you have available, but make sure it's fully integrated. Uh, such things as, you know, gather previous work at desk or desk studies, previous GIs, for instance, as an engineering geologist, and try and place them into a regional context. For instance, you know, you could plot them up on a BGS map and discuss some of the, the sort of regional issues that you would expect on your uh, GI from, from looking at the map. Um, use existing boreholes, uh, determine if the model needs revision, where are the uncertainties and how can they be addressed? Um, and then you can also demonstrate things via well correlations in 3D. Um, you know, you can discuss the uncertainties, you know, what new data could predictably change the model. This is quite important for, for instance, criteria two on the chartered geologist application. And some of the pitfalls, you know, uh, do not swamp the scrutineers with huge documents uh, because, you know, they are volunteers and they have to read them in their own time. Um, in the past, you know, we've seen some um, supporting documents which are greater than 200 pages long just for one document, and we've got six of them. Um, we now limit the entire um, application to 50 megabytes, um, including maps and diagrams. But, you know, bear in mind, I think uh, 30 pages is a good, good size for a, a single uh, supporting document, uh, as long as it's succinct and, it, you know, it fills a various criteria you want to um, bring out. You should also be adding a summary page to explain what the supporting document is, how it demonstrates competency, which competencies it's actually demonstrated and where in the document it is. Um, 
you should potentially think about showing a map uh, which um, shows the location of all your supporting documents in one place. Uh, that's great if they're all in, say, the, the same country or even if they're not, you could actually still uh, show a map of the world and just dot on where your different um, supporting documents are based. And it sets a scene for the scrutineers to think about, you know, what your broad knowledge is, you know, what, what geographical areas you've looked at. If they're all in the sort of the UK, a good idea is to actually annotate them all on a um, copy of a BGS geology map. And that, that really then allows them to think about, you know, which which areas you've worked, which basins, you know, which formations you've worked in. It already sort of starts making them think about what the supporting documents should be bringing out. Sorry. And then finally, um, try to clearly identify within your supporting documents uh, where you are demonstrating competencies, one to, one to seven or one to, one to five. Um, you can do this in a number of ways. You can actually, within the document itself, you can type in, you know, this, this demonstrates meeting criteria two, three, whatever, bold it up, colour it red or something, red font. Um, or you could annotate in the margin of your report and just, uh, again, do something similar. Make it really obvious that, you know, this is evidence for a particular criteria. So that's the, uh, the documentation. Hopefully everyone gets through that stage. Um, and then, um, you know, hopefully you'll be invited to an interview. So the interview format is normally um, usually less than two hours, but generally one and a half hours in total. Um, you'd start the, um, the interview with a 15 minute presentation for candidates with uh, 20 years or plus. They're expected to give a 30 minute presentation because they've submitted less information to uh, be questioned on. You could expect then questions covering all of the criteria, but you could also be questioned on both your uh, your presentation and also on your supporting documents or the you know your application itself. Um, make sure you're all fair with all your submitted documents, the work you did in the projects and the reasons for that work. You know we've found in the past that some people have submitted documents from work they did ten years earlier. They then neglected to review them again and understand them and, and familiarize themselves. Um, and in an interview that looks pretty poor and it goes, goes a little bit pear-shaped in terms of the uh, your questions you may get at that stage. Um, and also be prepared to answer questions on other, other competencies. You know, for example, you'll be asked to give examples of adherence to the code of conduct your responsibilities regarding health and safety on you know, the way you plan your CPD and uh, not neglecting the boundaries of your competence. The presentation itself, you know, we deliberately don't give you detailed guidance. Uh, we like you to think about it yourself and see how you can best showcase your own abilities to the scrutineers. Um, some general uh, things are would suggest these aren't the firm guidance, but uh, you know the, the suggestions. Don't present something you've already submitted on which the scrutineers have already read. Don't give a run through of your career CV on a couple of slides because it looks, to be honest, quite boring. Um, and you've already covered all that in your AD2. Uh, do find something that you're enthusiastic about, which you think demonstrates your competency. If you are enthusiastic about it, you tend to convey that to your scrutineers, which is a good thing. Include uh, photographs and diagrams, especially colour ones, colour pictures, for you know, which makes it more interesting uh, and entertaining. And the bottom line is try and make it interesting. You know, you've got the first opportunity to capture the interest of your scrutineers in the first 15 minutes. So try not to waste that opportunity. <clears throat> Finally. Um, remember, you've been assessed by scrutineers on your competency as a geologist. Um, we're not trying to assess your competency to do your day job. Your employers do that, you know, the job stock doesn't do that. So that's uh, all about the, the chartership application itself, just a bit of additional information. Um, we don't actually, in terms of mentoring, I'm often asked about mentoring. We don't actually help people find mentors. Um, you know, we don't have a list of mentors as such. 
So uh, what we did is uh, to get around the GDPR regulations, uh, we set up a LinkedIn group and this allows fellows uh, and candidates to ask for help or more experienced ones they can offer, um, submit and offer help to a mentee uh, or even as a sponsor. So basically, you know, what we suggest people do, uh, log on here, uh, ask to be um, accepted into the group. Normally myself would uh, be in a position to accept you. Um, Sure, um, you know, add a short um, sort of summary of who you are, who you work for, what what your specialty is, and uh, what you're looking for. Are you looking for some help from a, a mentor or a sponsor, or are you willing to offer help to others? But um, like all these things, you know, don't just sit back and wait for someone to come to you. Search through, scroll through the different members on the site, and uh, proactively search out someone who you think would be a really good mentor for you. Um, within the group and then you know basically contact them and befriend them and ask them to uh, help you. So that's about it now but uh, if you know if you want um, further information specific information which um, you know I'm, I'm very happy to do so um, just send me an email to this address and I'll, I'll respond as soon as I can. Any general inquiries or uh, we need to submit something to the JOSOC uh, use the charter shipping box. Uh, shown here. Um, I didn't show these during the um, during the uh, presentation itself, but since this is being recorded, uh, it's a good place to put um, in appendix one and two. These are the seven competency criteria uh, for charter geologists. Uh, they're all the equal way weighting, but obviously as a geologist, um, criteria one and two uh, are critical to uh, demonstrating your competency as a geologist. Um, and then for Appendix 2, I've also shown the same uh, five competency criteria for chartered scientists. Uh, that's it. I'll leave it there. And um, I'll happily take any questions you, you may have. Thanks for that, Sean. I'm sure everybody will agree that was a very detailed and informative presentation. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Uh, if anybody's got any questions, please do drop them in the, the Q&A box and we'll, we'll work through the questions that we've, um, we've been given so far. So, Sean, does a PhD count towards postgraduate experience or is it four years post-PhD? I was asked that question today by email. I don't know if it's the same person who's asking me again, but, uh, you know, my, my answer is that um, the, the number of years counts from you your first degree, so your BSc, BA. Um, so although I've not really come across this before, theoretically, yes, it should count for three years of work experience, providing it's an ideological subject um, or a scientific subject, I suppose, as well. Um, so it should do, as long as you can uh, use some of the information from your PhD thesis and your work to help in your application. Uh, does someone need to be a fellow of the Judgical Society to apply for chartership? Yes, they do. It's mandatory. Uh, you can't apply without that because you need your fellowship number in order to so, to um, access the form and fill it in. Uh, so we've got a question on the cost of chartership. Is the um, the payment a one-time payment or is it an annual payment plan for chartership? Uh, there is a one-off payment, which I believe is £120 for the application. And then there's an ongoing um, fee, which, to be honest, I couldn't tell you. It's in the region of £50 per year. Um, and I, say I, don't, I can't tell you because I'm not involved in um, basically um, dealing with that side of things. But yes, there's an online thing. But it will be, you would be billed at the same time that your annual membership would be billed. How many years of experience do geologists normally need before they can apply to become chartered? Um, okay, we've we've gone away from the, we used to have a table on the website which gave number of years of experience required before you could submit based on your degrees, your accredited degrees, uh, and various other things. We've, uh, we've stopped doing that now for a couple of reasons. One is uh, that some people learn much faster than others and some are slower, so takes longer or, or shorter. Um, secondly, some people have much more opportunity to have a varied career and their employers give them more options to uh, 
you know, look at different range of projects than others do. So we don't actually put a time frame on it now, but realistically, um, if you want to be pragmatic, um, you need at least four years, four to five years is still probably the, the bottom end of the uh, level of experience you need to be able to gather sufficient information and to demonstrate competencies. We have a question about applying for a chartered geologist or chartered scientist. So the example is if somebody's a hydrogeologist, should they look more towards the chartered scientist route rather than the chartered geologist route? Um, I think geologist on the back of hydro gives you a clue that we've got a huge number of chartered geologists who uh, work in uh, hydrogeology. Uh, we also have some chartered scientists who work in hydrogeology. So it really depends on where you came from, you know, what direction you came into that from. You know, was it from a geological degree based? or was it from a, a general science degree uh, background? Um, so you could do either, but I would recommend if you've had a geology, geological background and you've studied geology, go via the sea geol route first, and then in the future, apply for chartered scientists through a streamlined process, which we call the retrospective route. It's harder to go the other direction if you don't have a geology background. Uh, so it's easier to go from chartered geologist to chartered scientists and vice versa. Is there any review process for completed applications prior to final submission? No, there isn't. Uh, that's where your sponsors or your mentors um, role is uh, to review your application and give you some guidance. Uh, once it's submitted, um, basically we, the scrutineers will review it and either ask for more information or new information, or they will um, basically invite you to an interview. And finally, we have a couple of questions on CPD. So you mentioned a minimum of three years is required. If candidates have more than three years, should that be provided or is that considered over the top? Yeah, we asked for three consecutive years. The last, and we, so we assume that you give the last three consecutive years. You know, it depends on when you submit during a calendar year. If you have submitting close to the beginning of a year, then use the previous three years. Um, if you're right at the end of the calendar year, then, you know, include the two previous years plus the bulk of the current year. You know, just be sensible about it. Uh, does British Sign Language count as foreign language study as CPD hours? Sorry, can you <laughs> say that again? So um, can you confirm that learning British Sign Language will count towards foreign language study as a CPD hours? Uh, well, again, that's a that's a new question for me as well. Um, <laughs> um, I think if you look on that, let me just go back to the um, screen. I'll get my. Uh... Can't get my uh, tune back up now. Right, let me just go back to um, see if there's anything on this while I'm. Foreign language study, um, it doesn't, but um, I guess it's, uh, it's down to whether it's um, relevant to what you're doing as a, as a scientist or a scientist. I, I guess it could be considered relevant. I think you may have to make a case for it in, in, you know, in an interview, but I'm, I'd be quite happy to accept it if it's um, you know, if it's something that's developmental and for a reason. So the final question of the day is, is there any disadvantage of applying for chartership if you only have a bachelor degree opposed to having further education? Is there any disadvantage you're saying? Yeah. Uh, there's, no, I mean, basically the, um, anybody who attains chartership status is, uh, you know, working at a much higher level of competency than anybody without it. So, you know, the ultimate goal should be to acquire a chartership uh, to your name. Now, if you don't have a second degree, a um, master's at least, um, you're expected to demonstrate that you can work to master's level. Um, we do have a form, um, there's a guidance document on the website, and I think it's probably one of the guidance documents in the online form, which is 
M level equivalence is called. And you know, someone should read that. And they have to just submit a short report which demonstrates that they can work to M level. Um, it, because the, the trouble is, you know, if you've already left university and you're already working and trying to apply and then you, you find you don't have a master's, um, you know, you're a little bit snooked. So we've introduced this M level in, uh, in addition to uh, a BSc to help people um, overcome that, uh, that uh, problem area. And can you talk a little bit more before we finish on why you advise against applying for both chartered scientist and chartered geologist simultaneously? Okay, well, <clears throat> there's quite a number of reasons, to be honest, and I've seen a few people do it, and um, it's been very difficult, both from the geological society perspective of actually organising uh, scrutineers who are both chartered scientists and chartered geologists, um, because they would have to work through two completely set of documents. So it's, it's, it's quite onerous for them to actually review all the documentation for both charterships simultaneously. Uh, and the interview would be very lengthy. And um, there's a danger that, um, you know, people will become confused, both the candidate and the scrutineer in terms of questions they were being asked and the answers, because there's so much overlap, but also quite separate items as well. Um, I would say it's actually stressful enough for most people to apply for a chartership uh, anyhow without actually trying to do two at the same time. Um, so what we've done is we have introduced this system called the retrospective process. It is a streamlined process. So basically, if you acquire your first chartership um, successfully within a two year period, you can then retrospectively apply for a second chartership. <clears throat> be that either uh, chartered scientist after doing chartered geologist or chartered geologist after doing chartered scientist. And what you do on that occasion is you, um, you submit the forms, AD1 to uh, AD4. Um, AD4 is quite stream, simple. You submit the same documents again, but just update them for the, the missing section uh, of, you know, period. Um, you, uh, you also resubmit all your entire um, application from your first chartership. And, um, you know, hopefully you can reuse most of your supporting documents again for, for your second chartership. However, you know, you're at liberty to add additional ones in there if they don't all meet the criteria that, you, you know, you're looking to demonstrate. Um, and then what we'll do is we find a single scrutineer uh, who will review that application. You are not needed to, uh, you, you don't need to attend an interview. Uh, so basically um, it's a quite a painless route. You know, you submit, uh, we find someone to review it and, and basically we, we tell you what the answer, you know, whether you've been accepted. Um, but it's within a two year period. But I, I think there'll be too much stress and too, it will be too difficult to try and manage two at the same time. And just simple advice. There's nothing in the regulations that prevents you doing it, however. Great. Thanks, Sean. So that brings us to the end of the question. So thank you very much to both Becky and Sean for joining us this evening. And thank you very much for all the <coughs> attendees for coming along. We had a few questions about the recording. Um, the ECN will send an email around to all the attendees with um, a link to the recording once it's available so you can watch it back. And any details you may have missed from Sean or Becky, you can you can get them back. So thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Okay, thanks very much, man. Thanks everyone for listening. Bye thank for now. You. Bye, Becky. Bye, bye everyone.